Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 28, Freedom Through Public Speaking, with our guest, Terry Brock of terrybrock.com. Terry is a Hall of Fame speaker. Yes, that exists. He started in radio and built a career where he now can travel the world and get paid to speak on various topics, including technology, marketing, business development, and entrepreneurship. A true Liberty Entrepreneur. Please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com and on YouTube. This episode is full of energy and wisdom, and I hope you enjoy. With me today is Terry Brock of terrybrock.com. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, it is great to be here with you. Finally, I've been admiring your podcast for a long time, Ash, and I'm honored to be here with you. Thank you so much, Terry. So give us a quick bio and what you're interested in and who you are. Well, I'm a lover of liberty. I love the idea of living your life as you want without harming anyone else and taking responsibility. And I've been doing that in the form of being a communicator, which is what I've done most of my life. And even before I was uh, out of school, I started actually in journalism. Uh, I was working, uh, covered uh, a community paper, worked for them for a while, worked in radio when I was in high school. And the paper I worked for, they liked what I was doing and sent me to Washington, D.C. And I covered Richard Nixon's inauguration. Mm. So you kind of do some math on that, say, oh, that's how old that guy is. <laughs> but uh, then I went on and I uh, said my undergrad degree was radio, TV, newspaper. And I thought, hmm, I need to know some things about this thing called business. So I went back for an MBA and they filled my head with all kinds of stuff like cash flow statements, income statements, and chi-square analysis and that kind of stuff. And then I started teaching myself computers when I got out and how to use these and eventually got into speaking that way showing people how to do it, because I discovered a really cool thing. There's people that would give you money for this. Woohoo! I like that. Yeah, yes. but, uh, let's go for it. And, uh, I just started back in 83 as a professional speaker and have been doing it ever since and plan to do it, as you and I were mentioning before, at least for another 737 years. That's a long time, Terry. You're looking great, let me tell you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how did you start to appreciate public speaking? Or how I, This is if not the number one most common fear of people in general. It is a fear. Yeah, a lot of people have that because they uh, don't have the skills. And I think the key is getting the skills, getting the skills and getting the competency, which then gives you the confidence to go forward. And I think that as you uh, work with it, you get better. For me, I find that I'm still learning. Even though I've done it, uh, again, since 83, I feel often like I'm just beginning all over again each time I get up in front of a group. I was just uh, out in Vegas speaking a couple of days ago to a group of uh, highly successful insurance people from a very large, well-known insurance company and getting a chance to show them new technologies, new ideas that they can use. And when they go, oh, wow, and you see them writing things down and they're going, yes, that's good. We know that it's uh, making progress and really helping them. And what was it about speaking that drew you to it? I mean, again, coming back to, I know this is a lot of people's number one fear, but to you, it's, um, it's something that you excel in. It's one of your strengths. I, I don't imagine that it was always one of your strengths. So can you walk us through your mindset of how you started to appreciating public speaking eventually to the point of where you could do it for a living? Yeah, I think it's something that is uh, done by practice, by trying and seeing what's happened, by doing it over and over, you learn what to do. And not just doing it over and over, but getting good advice, getting good correction, people that can help you. One of the smartest things I ever did is uh, five years after I started, uh, around 1988, I met someone uh, named Jim Cathcart, who is also a professional speaker, and he was at an event in New York where I was speaking, and I said, oh, I'm a, a speaker also, and he says, oh, really, are you a member of the National Speakers Association? I said, what is that? And he got a piece of paper, and he wrote it down, gave me their number, and I called them, and I had to make a decision at that point. Do I get serious? Mm. Really get involved with people at the local level? I was in Atlanta at the time and the national level, and I decided, you know, I'm gonna go for it. And that really helped change me 
because I met a lot of other people who were professional speakers. They gave me good training with excellent workshops and how to do it and also how to handle the lifestyle. So I think that we keep getting better, we keep practicing, and by doing that, it becomes more fun. And frankly, it's a lifestyle that gives a lot of freedom. It gives you the ability to travel a lot and get to know a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah, I imagine so. I mean, I met you in Acapulco, Mexico, at mm -hmm. uh, Jeff Berwick's An Acapulco Conference. And we were there early on the first day giving speeches or giving presentations on entrepreneurship. And I, I can remember seeing you out in the crowd just smiling from ear to ear while I was presenting. And I was like, man, you know, this is this feels great. The, the people that are listening to this are, are really getting a lot out of it. And you approached me later and introduced ourselves. And I was very impressed. You were actually the MC or the main host of Anarchapoco. And I believe you're going to be the master ceremonies as well for Freedom Fest 2016 in Las Vegas this year. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. Really looking forward to that. Me and about 3,000 of my closest friends. Yeah, I, I was there last year and it's a really great conference for sure. So talk to me a little bit more about the freedom that you found by becoming a professional speaker and how that has given you more flexibility in your life or networking or just giving you more control. Ash, it is so good to be with you and be able to talk about that because you are about liberty and entrepreneurs and I love listening to your podcast and I just resonate with you and those of you that are listening to this right now, I'm with you. I mean, we grok this as I hold up my uh, live long and prosper thing on the video. <laughs> Or like we grok it. I find that freedom comes from speaking because you don't have as many government regulations. Mm -hmm. We're not regulated, at least not yet, as much. We can get out and do what we want. Also, you're not limited to any one geographical place. Mm -hmm. I get up and move around. I've spoken and done business in about 37 countries around the world and counting, getting even more. I find that I can go into a place and speak to them give them information that they can use. I talk about technology. Mm -hmm. I talk about social media. I talk about relationship marketing. My MBA is mar in marketing, so I really hone in on that, using the technology to connect with people. And that's a message that resonates with entrepreneurs around the world. And I get a chance to work with companies that are as small as a one-person solopreneur, all the way up to Fortune 5 and Fortune 10 companies. And it gives you the access to meet a lot of fun people and to get a chance to do many different things as a speaker. And I really enjoyed it. I remember once uh, American Express was releasing a new card uh, and they wanted to uh, talk to me because they saw what I did in the newspapers as a syndicated columnist and they saw that I was a speaker. So I went up there and, and I got a chance to work with Magic Johnson mm. and talk with him, get to know him as a person and be with him. Uh, as a speaker, I got a chance to know a, a speaker named Zig Ziglar. Mm -hmm. uh, died a few years ago. Just a wonderful man. Brian Tracy is a friend of mine. Mm. I know these people because I'm hanging around where speakers hang out and it's kind of fun to get a chance to know them. And I see them. I go into a bookstore and I see people on the shelf there and I go, oh, I know him. Harvey yeah. yeah, I know Jeff, Jeffrey Gittimer. And they signed our book, you know? And so it's like, I know these people really well. And you get a chance to know people and they're, they're good and the bad. And you realize, Hey, they're all uh, individuals and we all love the idea of freedom. So how important was networking to you becoming a successful public speaker? I think it's vital. I think you've got to be able to get to know other people, get to know them. And the way you do it best is how can you contribute value to them? All right. Not just walking and going, hi, I'm wonderful. Buy my stuff. Be my friend. You know, I know something. Let me teach you something. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, exactly. Too many people, uh, all the, they only want to talk about themselves. They have what I call eye trouble. And I don't mean E-Y-E -E, as in your physical I in your head. I mean the letter I. Mm. All they do is talk about themselves. Narcissist supreme. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that really you don't want to be around. Yeah. I find that those who are most successful are those who are networking to contribute to others, to help. Another person that I've met over and worked with over the uh, airwaves and through Skype and uh, Zoom, things like that, is uh, uh, Ivan Meisner, who is the head of uh, BNI. It's a wonderful business networking group that's international. A wonderful guy who talks about the importance of connecting with others and being with them and finding out their needs and helping them. That, I believe, is the way that we get ahead. I completely agree with you. That is the essence of Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast. You know, it's my opportunity to try to give the perspective of how entrepreneurs are at their very essence, trying to solve social problems, trying to solve 
pains that people have in their everyday life, right? Like I've, I've recently started getting my groceries delivered to my house because I don't really like going to the grocery store. It kind of wastes my time. It's, it's yeah. you know, for me, it's, it's below what I think my time is worth per hour. So now I just order online. They keep all my favorites. And all of a sudden the grocery store comes and delivers, you know, $150, $200 worth of food at my house every week. And it's wonderful. Yep. But we do the same thing. It, it, it just took, started. It took an entrepreneur to look out into society and, and think maybe there are busy people, business people that don't have time every week to go to the grocery store. So let me solve this problem for them. And I will devise a way and a website and all, you know, something to deliver what they want to their door whenever they want it. I can schedule it, I can schedule it a week in advance if I want. And it costs like $5 to have it delivered to my door. Super saving time for me. You mentioned something, Terry, earlier about how a professional speaker is, is an entrepreneur and is someone who is looking to contribute to others. That, I completely agree with you. And this is something that I feel people don't really know. I mean, we. I don't know about you, Terry, but I went to public school and I'm sure all my listeners know that by now because I've said it like a hundred times, but I didn't learn anything about an entrepreneur and I definitely didn't learn that entrepreneurs are the people that are driving forward progress and solving pains. Of course, we learned that it's the government that does that. It's the government that keeps us safe. It's the government that makes things better and you know all, all this stuff. Um, what, what type of contributions do you feel that you regularly are able to give to the people that you're speaking in front of? Well, for me, it's exciting to be able to see that I can literally help them make, do better in their job, that they can increase their bottom line. I do this regularly, showing them new technologies, new ways of applying it. And by the way, if you take this one and that one and you put them together in this way that not everybody talks about, look at the magic you can create with that. One of the things that really helped me was years ago as I was getting started, I worked, did a lot of classes teaching Coca-Cola. I was in Atlanta and got a chance to meet the people and work with them and had a number of classes on computers and technology. It was really exciting. They asked me to go over to uh, Central Asia. And so I spoke in Hong Kong, Indonesia, Thailand, and different places. When I was in Indonesia, in Jakarta, I met a person who didn't want to be there in the class. He had been working at some things. And they told me, frankly, later, they told me he probably was about to lose his job. But I showed them ways they could use this thing called a computer and start putting it together. He lit up and just really learned a lot. And he later became uh, the VP of uh, information technology for Coca-Cola there. And he told me, Terry, it was your class that inspired me and helped me. And that's not in the paycheck. That was just something that's wonderful and makes you feel like, hey, it's really good to be able to provide that value. Yeah, you don't see that on the invoice as a line item, do you? Right, that's right. But it really matters it's when people say, wow, it's great. And, you know, you gave us something we can really use. And I think that's part of the thrill of speaking, that if you do it right, you get the feedback. Here you walk onto a stage. These people don't know you at all. Mm -hmm. If anything, they're kind of sitting back there with their arms crossed going, all right, who is this guy? And how much Prove it, money? yeah. You know, for one hour, he's going to get that much money? That's right. ridiculous. Yeah. And so you walk into that, but then you have a chance to transform their lives, to make them laugh, make them uh, think, make them look at something new. And when they go, wow, I can use this. My people can use it. One of the greatest rewards for me is I often get as I'm walking out of a room, I've finished the program, they gave their applause, it feels good, and people are sitting there on their cell phone and they look over at me and go, Terry, I'm calling my office right now, telling them to get the such and such and the such and such that you mentioned. We can use that. Thank you. And many of those things are free. It's like, here's something free you didn't know about. Mm -hmm. Get this, use it in your company this way, and it can really improve your bottom line. So to continue that, you talk about connecting with the crowd through laughter, through eye contact. What, what in your experience has been the best ways to connect to a crowd? Let's say a crowd of 50 to you know 200 people or 500 people or something what techniques do you use to try to connect with your crowd build your personality and really have them you know capture the moment and come away with what you want them to come away with well there's several things to do and i think the most important is to find out what it is that they want to know listen to them one of the things i like to do when i talk to the meeting planner is get the names of about five six ten people that are going to be there that are in their association that are in their company and i call them up 
and I talk with them. And I'll say, hey, Ralph, I'm Terry Brock. I'm going to be the speaker at your meeting coming up in Las Vegas this next March. And uh, so-and-so, the meeting planner, gave me your name. And I want to call and find out, what are you dealing with right now? What are the uh, challenges you're facing in the widget industry? And for me, it's always a challenge because the journalist in me loves to do the questioning and find out. And then I can say, oh, you're going through this and this. You, there's a technology. Did you know about this that can do this for you? And they go, oh, what is that? And I can help them right there on the spot. But also, then I can share that with the group and say, hey, I was talking to Ralph. And everybody knows Ralph. He's doing this and this and this. Great guy. And he said he was going through this. Here's something you can use. And they're going, oh, we can use that. And so for me, that's a good way to connect with people beforehand. And then also during the event itself. I like to get there a little bit early if I can talk to them, find out more. And so that that way, I know a lot about various technologies. When I hear they have certain needs, I can apply that to the presentation I'm going to make to make it really relevant for them. And Terry, why do you think the advice exists and is pretty prevalent of picture your audience naked or something or like <laughs> what, what is the, what is this I think it's an attempt by people to try to say let's overcome the fear I found here's a way you can overcome the fear seriously when you're overcome when you're fearful you're looking at you you're thinking oh did I say this right did I do that right get out of your head get out of your own head and focus on them what are their issues what can you do now you find that out by going up and talking to them beforehand Often at the meeting itself, I walk up to as many people as I can and shake their hand, talk to them. Hi, I'm Terry Brock. I'll be your speaker today. And what's your name? Where are you from? And to try to establish some form of rapport, where they're from or what they're doing or some commonality we might have, even if it's just that they live in, uh, oh, pick a city, uh, Portland, Oregon. I go, oh, really? Portland, Oregon? Isn't that a 503 area code up there? Right, right. So I just learn a few little things like that and try to establish a bond. And now I'm focusing on them. Right. And as I think about how can I help them, it takes the pressure off of me and it's also helping them even more so that I can even go back and, you know, I was talking to Mary Lou beforehand and Mary Lou, if you don't mind, you were mentioning you know, in St. Louis there, you're doing the da 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 and, and that, that's in the 314 area code, right? Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, we got this and we're doing these things for you and you might go through, anyone else going through that kind of thing? Yeah. And they go, oh yeah. So relate to the people more. I realize that a lot of people have the eye problem. We're coming back to the eye problem. Yeah. Because I think this is this deserves a little bit more time here. One thing that I've thought for quite some time now is most people are just waiting for their next turn to talk. Yeah. And so if you're willing to have the patience of mind to sit and listen to them talk, then you're going to learn a lot more because it's very difficult to learn things that you're already speaking about because you're, mm -hmm. you already know them because you're speaking about them. As a professional speaker, as a public speaker like yourself, I imagine that most people just think that all you do is talk, right? Because you're up there getting paid to talk. This is your profession. This is what you're good at, right? But can you, can you chat about the role that curiosity plays in becoming a, a really quality public speaker? It's huge. Curiosity gives you the ability to inquire and to go in depth. So it's not just saying, well, Ash, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine. Really? What you been doing lately? What good things have been happening for you lately? What excites you about what you're doing? What projects are you working on? And you see, now I'm getting to know you more. Mm -hmm. And uh, how's that working out for you? Oh, well, it's good, but I had a problem with this. Really? Tell me more about that. See, if I'm doing that, then I'm getting to know you more. And then I can be much more useful and valuable to you than if I just say, oh, yeah, yeah. By the way, we're doing this, and I did this, and I did that. And let me tell you more about I. And, oh, well, enough about me. What do you think about me? Right, you know, that right, right. kind of nonsense that we hear from so many people. Do more follow-up questions, not in an interrogative way, like you're a police you know, trying to drill somebody, but rather genuinely care. You learn a lot more that way. And you find that your life becomes more enriched when you uh, use the old saying as, you know, you have two ears and one mouth. There's the proportion you should use them. Right, exactly. I have. So I started really appreciating curiosity about two or three years ago and, and actively incorporating it into my life. And you know, this podcast is partially a derivative of my increased curiosity over time, because like you said, I have felt that my life is so much more rich and I find so much more joy in literally everything I do and the people that I interact with because I'm not afraid to be like, Terry, I, you know, it looks like you're getting in shape. Talk, like, are you eating healthy? Or are you working out? Or like, Terry, I see you've got, you know, a ton of flags back there on your, on your wall. Like, are, are those all the places you visited or spoke at or, 
or just, you know, how, how's the job going or what, what are you excited about public speaking wise these days? Right. And it's yep. just, it, it bring it brings a lot more vibrant energy. I feel like into my life. Yeah, it really does. You become much more enriched that way. You learn a lot. And that's where the international travel comes in as well. As you and I both are doing that, I find we learn a lot. We're all born on a certain piece of dirt. We live somewhere and we grow up. I grew up in the Midwest in a very small rural environment in Michigan and loved it. It was great. I was raised a certain way. But I find I learn a lot more when I go to other places and I listen to them. And actually, Ash, you might have found this also. I found through science and uh, ob- uh, scientific experimentation on my part, you usually find out more from someone after about the second or third local drink <sighs> local pub, for science purposes, of course. Yeah, sure. You find out a whole lot more about what's going on by listening rather than just Terry blabbering away about what I think. It's like, Ash, I see you. You're on your fifth beer. Don't worry. It's for science and curiosity. There you go. It's for science. And, <laughs> and try some of this wonderful local vodka. It's <laughs> really good. <laughs> so curiosity between two people, while it can be difficult, you know, it's a lot easier just to ask somebody questions and try to connect with them. How do you use curiosity whenever you're up on the stage? On the stage, I'm always wondering, okay, what are they doing? Your mind is uh, always looking at what they are doing, how they're reacting. If you're seeing them paying attention to you, that's one thing. If you see them, oh, they're talking to each other or they're looking elsewhere, or they're checking their cell phones, you know you're going the wrong direction. Hmm. Time for you to stop and go, okay, what's going on here? You've got to have that curiosity that drives you and makes you hungry for knowledge. Curiosity makes you hungry for knowledge. Yeah. The more you can have that, the more knowledge you can acquire. Absolutely. You want to know what's going on, how they're reacting, what they think, and uh, where they're hurting. And by having that curiosity mindset, you do a lot more. I don't like being around people that are in the know-it-alls. Now, I know this. I know everything. I'd much rather be around people that go, really? Well, tell me why or why is that? Yeah, I remember I listened to a podcast called um, Free Domain Radio by Stefan Molyneux. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. And he said that the three most important words in a relationship, of any relationship, he was specifically talking about romantic relationships, is not, I love you. It is, tell me more. Tell me more. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I agree with that. I think that as you ask that, tell me more in many different ways, you learn a lot more. You become a much more enriched and more well educated human being. And as you do that, people also will lean in to you. They'll want to know more about you. They like you more because you show that you're really interested in them. And it's got to be genuine. We can see it when somebody's fake. We cut right through that. Right through it. Someone that is genuine, though, that wants to do it, you feel like, hey, I want to get to know this person a lot more. Yep. So let's give, uh, let's go back to your beginnings and how you got started with public speaking, because I want to give people, you know, what I'm trying to do is help people get into the mindset of what it takes to start building a skill to, to be able to sell it hopefully around the world. So they have that lifestyle freedom and flexibility. And just sometimes the, the hardest steps are the very first ones because you have no momentum. Maybe you have an idea in your head, but you don't have any actual practical steps to take to start working towards your goal you have no momentum what once you start building something and even me with this podcast you start getting more energized and you start learning things right and you start learning from your mistakes and and building on your strengths can you walk us through terry initial steps that you would recommend young entrepreneurs or young people that are looking to get into public speaking and maybe some resources that they can use or more of the mindset that they they could be in to help them I think the most important thing is that you have something you want to speak about, have something of value. If you're just getting started, you might not have a whole lot of experience. And you can stand up and you could give a book report, so to speak. You've read several books and talk about something. Don't tell me how to be a multi-billionaire if you're 18 years old and you haven't worked anywhere before at all and haven't earned any money. But instead, get out and do something. Do something useful. What I did, I'm talking about my own experience. I went through undergrad school in radio, television, newspaper, learned that, then my MBA. And and then I started applying the cash flow statement principles that I saw in class on these new things at the time called spreadsheets. So I taught myself how to use a tool back then called SuperCalc and another one called Lotus123. And I just learned those and applied those principles. And then I started teaching others about that. Started teaching accountants because right. they needed to know that. And so I could show them that. And I like to often say I showed the accountants do it. We made it fun. Mm -hmm. Made it fun by doing it. And several of those accountants came very close to actually having an emotion. It was amazing. (laughs) But I got a chance to show them. And so you got got them to crack a smile, did you? 
Yeah, they did that. They even some of them smiled. Yeah, oh, it was wow. amazing. <laughs> but I, I love accounts. I've worked uh, for the AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, as well as about 27 state societies of CPAs. I don't do that much anymore, but I've worked with them. And I'm not an accountant myself. But I found that what you want to do is, for the person getting started, find something that you're really good at, an expertise. Fortunately, today, you can do it real easily. If something comes out, like for instance, I'll give an example that's current uh, today, Periscope or Blab are two tools for communicating via video. Mm -hmm. There's enormous possibility and potential with those two tools, become an expert in those. If you think, hey, that's something I kind of like, I want to learn it, now you can go and teach others that. You can start speaking about it. So always have uh, your eye open and your ear to the ground, so to speak, on what people want to know about, they, want, they value. Bitcoin's another example. Become an expert in Bitcoin. There's a lot of people out there that want to know that and you can start teaching them. And people will say, hey, you can teach me Bitcoin. You got a book or a video or a class or you can do coaching. There's a host of ways that you can make money doing that. And I think that is a good way to get started in speaking and I would say even more communicating. Because in the National Speakers Association, and I'm working with associations around the world, like just got back from the Professional Speaking, Professional Speakers Australia. They just changed their name. And Professional Speaking Association over in the UK, we speak, we've spoken for them. We find that they're doing more than just speaking. They speak, but they also write. They coach. They facilitate. They do a host of different topics and different skill sets. So develop those skill sets and get involved in a group of people like here in the United States, we have the National Speakers Association, the NSA. It's oh. not the National Security Agency. We're the NSA that does the talking, not the listening. No, right. Okay, good idea. Right. And so the NSA is a good group to get involved in. They have a lot of local chapters around the country. And if you are a speaker, this is a good place to learn, meet people, and really learn what it's all about and get the necessary skills and then attend the meetings. They have conventions and workshops. You learn the real skills that you'll need to be effective as a professional speaker. So, yeah, I hope that all the young entrepreneurs really appreciate that. Our name is Liberty Entrepreneur, so let's take this to the Liberty side again. Why should liberty-minded people, some of us call ourselves anarchists or minarchists or Ron Paul Republicans or voluntarists or whatever we would like to label ourselves, how has being an entrepreneur helped explore liberty in your own life? And why is it an integral part of being a truly free person? I think it's enormous potential in being an entrepreneur and being freedom oriented and a liberty lover, whether whatever term we're going to use for that, because it gives you the opportunity for unlimited upside and it gives you opportunity to be what I like to call GI, geographically independent. Mm -hmm. You're not tied to one piece of dirt. If you get out there and find a way to uh, do something like I do, speaking and writing, I can go around the world and I literally do bouncing here and there, speaking where we can find that we can contribute value. And so being an entrepreneur gives you enormous freedom and multiple sources of income. Mm -hmm. If you're a speaker, you can then speak and then like you and I are using a tool right now called Zoom. And matter of fact, I introduced it to you. You're just using it today. What do you think so far of it, it by is, the way? It's been terrific. Yeah, it's a great little tool. And we're, cre we're recording this right now with a tool like Zoom, which is free. You can then capture the essence of your audio, your video, and you're able to then put that into the form of a, some product that people will buy. You can connect with people like on Skype. So you can answer their questions using a tool like PayPal. One person pays the other and everyone's happy that way. Yeah, I, I know that, you know, I was, I'm in the Liberty Movement, but I started in the Liberty Movement back in 2007 with Ron Paul. It was my first mm -hmm. foot in the door. And I quickly saw how the ideas of the marketplace were really held up high. You know, the market is the peaceful way that, that two people can interact and do business together or choose to associate with, with each other or not. And it's not based on force like, like government intervention is. But it seems like, you know, even after listening to Lou Rockwell or Ron Paul or even the Mises Institute, that even though the market is held on most high, entrepreneurs aren't really spoken about. They're, they're not really discussed that much. It's like the market is this abstract thing that just mm. kind of happens. And I agree with that, but there are cogs in this market. It's just not this big thing of jello that's called the market. And it just moves around and everybody's in it. You know, right. There are actually people building 
this market that we always talk about. And those people are the entrepreneurs. Let me, let me bring an analogy to you, Terry. Back a long time ago, I think we, we may have, you know, three or five years difference between us. I believe it could be a couple. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know about you, but back a while ago, jocks were, the, the, the guys in high school and college and, you know, the, these are the guys that were the coolest and the ones that everybody wanted to be like and the ones that the girls just, you know, went crazy for. And then it seemed in the 90s as the tech bubble started to build and just technology in general became more and more incorporated into all of our lives that it was more of the geek or the nerd, the guys that could program, the guys getting the $200,000 salary from some online company that was starting up because everybody was pouring money into this. And your engineers started becoming what people wanted to be like because they were smart and they were clean and they were doing really cool things like inventing cell phones or now they're doing you know driverless cars. I think that the entrepreneur is the next stage in that evolution. You know, I, I, I know that with the economic recessions we're having, people are always talking about jobs and people are always scared like, man, I'm stuck in this one place and I don't really have that much opportunity. So I see the geek turning to the entrepreneur now as the guy or the girl that is heralded almost and looked up to and people want to be like the entrepreneur because he, he or she has control over their finances and the ability to network, the ability to not have to take orders from a boss. Granted, you're still taking orders from your clients. Mm -hmm. but, you know, what do you think about this? Oh, I agree with you completely. I think that it's now cool to be an entrepreneur and it really fits with a liberty lifestyle. It's the idea that we can get out there and we can create value in the marketplace in a host of different ways. And we can do that in a host of different places. We really aren't limited by somebody drew a line in the dirt 100 years ago, 200 years ago, and they called that this country and that over there was the other country and they fought some wars or whatever. And I, I'm from for this piece of dirt and you're for that piece of dirt and we might fight. But rather we say we can produce value. And wherever you can produce value in the world, you can bring about a lifestyle for yourself that is better, that is richer, and actually more free because you're able to do a lot of things that I'm talking about completely legally. You can do it. You've got expenses and you are going somewhere. You're going to make money. Your flight over to uh, out of Brazuvia, wherever you're going to speak, is paid for and deductible. You're able to do it. the meals that you're going to have there, the lodging you'll have there, and you make sure you do it right. You're generally trying to produce money, showing a profit that you'll have, and then you're going to be better off. So I think the entrepreneur lifestyle is great. It's much better than it was when it was, uh, at least for me, you know, the jocks and all that. But now I remember uh, I had an interview, a chance opportunity to interview uh, Magic Johnson. Uh, American Express asked me to come up and do a seminar. I interviewed him. There was a bunch of people all around. We had a lot in the audience. And he and I are also from Michigan. Hmm. Both of it. He's from Lansing. I'm from Jackson. And I remember saying to him, you know, I remember growing up looking around, seeing guys like you playing basketball. I thought I better get into computers rather than <laughs> basketball. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I really, you know, we're both kind of nerdy and I yeah. really, I really appreciate these geeks and the nerds in the nineties and early two thousands for building all this infrastructure so that entrepreneurs like us can take advantage of it, leverage it and build a global business so that we do have the freedom to move around the world. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's a smart thing to do. Don't put all of your eggs in one country. Oh, exactly. Make exactly. sure that you've got a diversification. People like Peter Schiff say that very well, who uh, you, know, you know, of course, and work, working with him, you get a chance to see it. But I agree. We want to look at different places, diversify our skill set, diversify our assets, diversify geography. Doug Casey has talked about this for years, and I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. Yes, this, you know, the multiple flags theory that Simon Black and some other guys talk about where you, yep. you want to um, set flags where you live and where you work and you know all the sources of income and where your bank accounts are because this is a way to to provide more freedom in your life and I think entrepreneurship is the best way to do that. Uh, Terry, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Is there anything else you'd like to cover? Anything you'd like to plug? Any additional advice that you'd like to give young entrepreneurs and our listeners out there? Oh, wow. I'm a speaker. Yeah. You got about four more hours at least for me to get started on that. <laughs> Let me just say this. First of all, somebody says, well, how can we get in touch with this, Terry? Well, you go to the best thing is you'll see all my social media contact, phone numbers, everything, email. Uh, go to uh, terrybrock.com and that's spelled T-E-R-R-Y and Brock is spelled the right way, B-R-O-C-K. So terrybrock.com. You can see that. And I would say for those of you listening, now is the time. 
yes, we are aware of what's going on in the world. We read the newspapers. We see the, oh, my goodness, did they do that? Oh, did you see what those knuckleheads just did in Congress about this? Yes, we're aware of that. But we're also vividly aware of the enormous opportunities for entrepreneurs to live a liberty lifestyle today. If you do it right, continue to educate your mind. Continue to pour good information in your mind. I love the way Ben Franklin said it. I can mention this real quick. Really important. Pour the coins of your purse into your mind, and your mind will overflow your purse with coins. Mm. Learn and get out there, network with other people, and keep that curious mindset, Ash, that you talked about. So important. If you do that, you'll do well. And I hope I get a chance to bump into you sometime. Somewhere down the road, you say, hey, Terry, I heard you there with Ash when you were talking about that on Liberty Entrepreneurs. I'd love to get a chance to chat with you sometime. And uh, hey, who knows? We might sit down over a couple of good uh, beverages sometime and uh, have a great conversation. And Ash, thanks for, being, uh, for having me on. I really yeah, You're very welcome, Terry. And we'll see you at uh, Freedom Fest in Las Vegas in July this year. Sounds good. All right, Terry. Thank you so much. And thank you for listening to another episode of Liberty Entrepreneurs. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to travel the world and speak on topics that you're passionate about and get paid as your career? Tune in again next week for another episode. And thank you so much. Tell a friend. Rate us. Bye-bye.